Wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Mother Liz Costello. It's a joy to be with you tonight. I realize that many of you uh, took advantage of the webinar that just happened. So if that's you, thank you for making this a double feature. And if you um, said, hey, I need a break, thank you for joining us whenever you do decide to join us later on in the day or week. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Host disabled participant screen sharing. So I'll, I'll share my screen in just a moment, but today we are going to focus on um, the liturgical space of sanctuary and altar. Can everyone see my PowerPoint okay? Wonderful, wonderful. So before I begin, just a word of thanks. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this course. I think this is just such a fantastic way that the Episcopal clergy of the front range and the Episcopal church can collaborate together. I love the fact that many of my parishioners are here and get to um, benefit from the wisdom and insight from my clergy colleagues. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this fantastic Episcopal 101. I also so appreciate that this is a course that's being taught through the use of sacred space and practice. I don't know about you, but I tend, like many Protestants, to think about Episcopal 101 courses and my faith through the lens of belief. But we know as Christians, much of our how do we be Christian, how do we be Episcopalian is actually through our practices. And what better of a way to dig into that and to appreciate that than to look at our liturgical space. So with that, um, as a point of reference for our um, conversation tonight, let me introduce you to my current parish that I am serving, St. Gregory's Episcopal Parish. We're located in Littleton, just two miles from Columbine High School. So we are very south um, of, of most folks. We kind of lean into the um, High Plains region, but we are happy to be with the Front Range region. To understand the story of St. Gregory's Episcopal Church is to understand a little bit about our patron saint. So just indulge me for a moment as I share with you a bit about St. Gregory the Great. St. Gregory the Great, as you may know, was the Pope during the time of St. Augustine of Canterbury during the late 500s. So around 597, he sent St. Augustine of Canterbury to go to southern England to go and to try to convert, missionize the Anglos. And this, of course, is the beginnings of the Anglican tradition. St. Augustine of Canterbury met Queen Bertha, who was the then queen, and she quickly came to faith. And like a good and faithful wife, she, drag she dragged her husband, King Ethelbert, to church. And through her good works, <laughs> he became a Christian, and thus um, the rest of the, his um, jurisdiction became Christian. And so this was very huge for um, Anglican's origin story. Now, St. Gregory the Great is not just appreciated by Anglicans, Episcopalians, but also Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox alike. And in the height of the ecumenical movement, recall with me that time in the 1960s and 70s when the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Communion, and the Roman Catholic Church thought that one day we could be in full communion. At the same time, the Reverend George Weeble and the Reverend Jack Knight thought, ah, let's make um, an ecumenical ministry experiment together. And so this Roman Catholic priest, the Reverend George Weeble and the Reverend Jack Knight thought, wouldn't it be a great idea for us to use the same architect, build three parishes, one for the Roman Catholic, one for the Episcopal, one for the Greek Orthodox, share priests and share uh, common spaces. And so then that is how St. Gregory's vision was casted. We were a mission of St. Timothy's Episcopal Church before they moved um, to Dry Creek. They were over in downtown, closer to downtown Littleton and Father Jack Knight um, um, helped with this sort of mission from St. Timothy's. 
the blessing of the chapel was in um, our first chapel that we met in to, to worship the Lord together, to celebrate the Eucharist, was in Father Jack Knight's basement. And I love these old photos. Thank you, Nancy Kearney, who is on this call for supplying them for me. This, these are some original photos from the original chapel in the basement. Now, I just love the credence table right next to like the bare, um, you know, concrete and then in the egress window up there. And then, of course, priests, don't you love these chasubles hanging? Wouldn't you love that for a vesting room? Um, we've got more pictures to share. On March 12th, 1973, a, a year later, Bishop Fry came out um, for a parish visit. And you can see how the altar um, was dressed. And um, my favorite here is on the bottom, if you can see it, um, this chasuble that has not one, not two, but five butterflies on it. Because after all, we were in the 1970s. 1975, we had our groundbreaking. You can see there Bishop Fry at the time next to um, Father Knight. And this is sort of the the origin story here. Um, the local news did a little spread on us about this ecumenical experiment because we had our altar that we still use today, our main altar in our church, consecrated not just by Bishop Fry, the Episcopal Bishop, but also the Roman Catholic Bishop. Because of course, if a Roman Catholic priest was to celebrate mass on our altar, it needed to be um, consecrated, blessed, made holy by the Roman Catholic Bishop. This is our interior space today. You can see sort of the, the view of the nave leading up to the altar. This is our side chapel. We call it our Mary and Martha chapel. Other parishes you might call it, um, you know, a lady chapel. We call it the Mary and Martha. We also built, in addition to a parish hall, um, which is still in use today, um, a garden, which I consider our third meeting space. It's a Denver urban garden and it's registered. We, we produce harvest about, I'm told, two tons of food and we, we donate about one ton of it away. We also share a prayer garden with the Roman Catholics. Um, and this is a, a photo up to the right-hand corner of our recent blessing of the animal service that happens every St. Francis um, feast day that we transfer to a Sunday afternoon. And um, this is Mother Terry Colburn uh, subbing for me. And just behind her is the altar that we share still today uh, alongside with Father Israel. As you may um, know, the Episcopal Church's hope to realize this ecumenical vision of being in full communion with the Roman Catholic Church did not happen. 1976, women were ordained, and that sort of put the nail in the coffin when our orders were considered utterly null and void. And so while we didn't get to fully live into that uh, vision, um, if you were to come to our church today, you would see that we have a lot of the same, um, our architecture looks the same as the Roman Catholics. We continue to try to live into that relationship through sharing these pastoral offices. We donate the food, one ton of that food, mostly to their food bank that folks from the neighborhood come and um, use. And um, Father, the, the rector and I are um, our friends, so we meet regularly. So while we, we cannot live into the fullness of the vision, what it did provide us the opportunity was to sort of self-differentiate and to realize um, our own mission and um, ministry being in relationship with them. So this is a little bit about um, St. Gregory's Church. Let us transition now to considering the sanctuary and the altar. Before we begin, I thought it would be important just to name a few things. First, the incarnation. Whenever we're talking about sacred space, practice, objects, rites, rituals, it's always important to name that as Episcopalians, we affirm the incarnation. Incarnational theology is important to us, and somebody it's so important that someone's going to have their own session on it, so I'm not going to go into it too much. But just to say, because we serve a God who sent God's only son to take on human flesh, right, to divinize human flesh, right, um, we affirm as Episcopalians the embodied experience of worshiping the triune God. And so it's important as we sort of set out to note that this is what um, differentiates us from some of our um, evangelical non-denom brothers and sisters in Christ is that we like our smells, bells. We like, maybe you don't, maybe that's too far. We like our chalices, patents. We like our processions. We like vestments because it all helps us engage our senses and, and enter us into the worship of God. This is just another um, 
piece of artwork for us to consider the implications of the incarnation in our worship. This is a, a French uh, statuette. You can see it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's also important to note that we are a wide tent. And so I love these little memes um, that I included. One of them, the bottom one, I think is a J. Botham. It looks like his cartoon. Um, and the, the priest with the guitar says um, to his minister of music, just curious, when might we include some contemporary music in the liturgy? And the organist responds, how about never? Does never work for you? never worked for me, right? And so this is just a recognition alongside, this is um, the right hand um, one. I put this for my husband, Joseph Liniak, who's also a priest, how high church Episcopalians react when some someone says that the Episcopal church is Protestant, which is what I say, the Protestant Episcopal church. So just to know that Whenever we get to sacred space and we gather around the altar, right, we're making this journey to the altar where Jesus promises to be especially present in the bread and the wine, to, to have it be transformed and then to transform us as we receive it. It's important just to note how we practice this through our objects, even what the sacred space looks like, is going to reflect uh, the theology and inclinations of the wide tent that is the Episcopal Church. So let's consider some common objects that we would find um, close to the altar, close to um, or within the chancel, um, within the sort of sanctuary area. So we would find a veiled paten um, chalice, we'd find the gospel book, we'd find the altar book, we would find a lectern, uh, we would find a pulpit. Um, we might just use a music stand as a pulpit. Maybe we don't have a pulpit. Actually, St. Gregory's doesn't have a pulpit. Um, objects that we might find on the altar or around the altar would also include, like we mentioned, um, a veil or vested chalice. So if, um, I know I have some altar guild folks. You could teach this part of the class. So I'm just gonna refer you to these fun diagrams. Um, we'll go into the, the history and the significance in just a little bit, but just to name, we have our chalice here. We have our paten, we have the corporal that we lay down underneath it, a purificator, a pall, a burst. Notice that these names we also hear um, being um, used whenever we have somebody who has died and is in a casket, right? Or has cremains. There's meaning, there's significance. We'll wait to go over that. Some folks might have a, thurfer, a thurible and a boat near the altar in, this, in the chancel area. Some folks might have sanctus bells. So if we were to look at just this um, altar here, you would typically see a frontal, right? An altar frontal. You would see acolyte lights, right? Um, little uh, torches would be there. We'd have candelabras in the back. Uh, we might have a cross or a crucifix hanging up as a sort of center point beyond the altar. We would have, we already mm -hmm. talked about the um, vested chalice. We would have the gospel book on the altar and then um, the altar book. If you were to lift up the frontal and the linen, the fair linen that sat that sits on top of the altar, you may find um, five crosses on the altar. And you, you particularly encounter this on um, days like Monday, Thursday. So on, on every corner, there would be a cross. And then in the center, there would be a cross reflecting the five wounds of Christ. So let us consider um, the space, the sanctuary, the altar a little bit more. Um, if you were to come to St. Gregory's Church, you would um, notice that our font is not in the back of the church because we move it to the front so everyone can see it. But traditionally speaking, the font would typically be in the back of the church to symbolize the sort of pilgrimage that one makes to enter into the church through the baptismal font, entering through the nave and up to the altar. Now, if you were to come to St. Gregory's, you would notice that we have two prominent um, stained glass windows to the right and the left. And they're significant, and I'm trying not to go too much into meaning now, but just to say a little bit um, to situate us, that you see on the left-hand side would be Jesus, as you see, with the globe. This is the second advent, Jesus' second coming. And then on the right-hand side, you'd have the Madonna and child, the first coming of Christ, right? The first advent. And then the meaning, of course, and we'll dig into this in just a second, being that we, the people who sit in the nave and are approaching the altar, the, the sanctuary, the chancel, beyond the altar rail, 
are living in this in-between time, right? Between the first and second advent of Christ. This is our altar um, right here. It's made of stone. Um, and so just to, to make sure that we're all using the same language, I'm just going to name some objects in our space, and then you can try to apply it to your church space. So uh, most churches have altar rails, right? Um, we have some kneelers. Thank you to my parishioners who made them beautiful. It's the life of Christ in each and every single one of these, um, representing each and every uh, cushions. And then we would have um, the lectern. My church, we don't have a um, a pulpit. So, you know, space always wins. So I typically preach from the floor um, or the nave right on the chancel steps there. Um, but you'd have your altar. Behind the altar, you'd have a tabernacle, usually hanging up, depending on um, when your church was built. You might have some kind of cross, maybe even a crucifix. This is Jesus, um, you know, the uh, resurrected Christ um, on our crucifix. Um, on the side, you'd have a credence table right, where you would hold all the vessels that you would need to make Eucharist together. You would have um, candelabras in the back, altar candle, the left one being the gospel candle, the right. Um, and then you would have the plate for the offering. You would have chairs. Perhaps your church is um, a little bit different. Maybe you have uh, choir stalls. Uh, maybe your church looks a little more like this. Um, you know, the cathedral downtown Denver um, is sort of medieval style, and so it has a root screen. Um, great significance, a uh, threshold in which the people have um, to cross, right? Um, who sits behind the root screen? Who is invited in the root screen? So typically today we would see the clergy, Eucharistic ministers, um, the choir, the minister of music, anybody that has anything to do really with the worship um, of, and, and the great Thanksgiving. Um, you can see here the pulpit and then to the right hand side, the lectern, all within um, the sanctuary. I wonder, have you been to a church? Does your church have an east facing altar? Does it have a high altar? And then because your church eventually wanted to have a west facing altar, did you um, add an extra altar um, in the middle of the chancel? Um, did you create sort of a situation where you had a sanctuary with two altars? Does your priest turn their um, back to you and look to the, the direction in which Jesus will rise again in which the triumphant church um, joins us in the Eucharist um, at the great Sanctus, right? Beyond space and time, they join us. Or does your priest turn and look at you in which it would be west facing? Which direction um, are the chairs, um, the gathered, right? During um, the Eucharist, during the proclamation of the word, are you looking at one another? Are you looking at... Um, the altar and then one another? Are you looking straight up at the altar? This is uh, the cathedral in Philadelphia. To the left is their altar table and to the right is their um, lectern. Here's another church with a very traditional um, architectural style, which we don't see so much out West, so we won't linger here long. But look, they have a high altar, but they wanted to bring their altar um, into the round or sort of semi-circle. So they moved, they made another altar and moved it down um, so that folks could both look at the Eucharist and then um, through the body and blood of Jesus, see the body and blood of Jesus who are gathered, right? Um, while also recognizing that they couldn't move this big honking um, pulpit or high altar or lectern. So that gets to stay there. And it's probably only used for an All Souls Requiem if they even do it. All right. This is another church in Philadelphia, just to kind of give a sense, Christ Church, Philadelphia, a very historic church for us. Uh, William White was there, Absalom Jones was there, two very historic, important figures for us with a big, um, you might guess it, influence on the word. Look how big that pulpit is. I can't even see the altar. You know, granted this view, I wish it was dropped down a little bit more, but having gone there myself, and perhaps you can attest to the same thing, the, the, the pulpit seems like it's the biggest focus in um, this um, particular Episcopal church. But we know that um, we can um, celebrate the Eucharist. We can create an altar just about anywhere. This is at the St. Francis Center. When I was a curate at St. John's Cathedral, I wanted my first mass to be at the St. Francis Center. So I snuck away at 7 a.m. with uh, the Reverend Becky Jones, who may be here in the room right now, uh, who is my deacon at the time. And um, just to say that we, you can have an altar just about anywhere. 
But what separates us, what makes us a little different um, from our non-denom evangelical brothers or sisters is our focal point, right? This is a, a photo of a megachurch. What's the focal point here? Is it an altar? Is it the speaker? Might it be a worship band if they were up there at this time? This matters for us. It says something. Architecture points us to worship and it makes a theological statement. And this is why lots of liturgists always like to tell their priests and deacons or lay leaders in seminary that the building always wins. So I want you to, uh, I want to invite you to take a moment to reflect on your own sacred space, your context that you're coming from. When you enter your church, what's the focal point? Well, it's going to be the altar, most likely, because you're at an Episcopal church. But is there other focal points? Where is your eye drawn? Notice, are there any thresholds to get to the altar? Do you guys have a, a, a roof screen? Maybe not. Do you have an altar rail? Um, where is the lectern, pulpit, and altar in your church? What shape do the gathered make in relationship to the altar? Are you in the round? Are you in a semicircle? Are you kind of one direction? Who sits closest to the altar? I know it's COVID time, so it's a little different, but is it just the clergy? Do you have choir um, up there? Do you have Eucharistic visitors, acolytes? Who sits closest to the altar? What objects are in your chancel or the area around the altar, this sort of inner sanctuary area? Is the altar at your church east, west facing? How many do you have? You might have a few. We have three at my church. We share one. What materials, um, what objects are at um, your altar? And what material is your altar made of? Is it stone? Is it wood? And um, do you, and think about, and like, listen out for this. Do you or your priest, your clergy, do they refer to the altar as an altar, which I do, sorry, <laughs> or a table <laughs> or both, right? It could be both, all right. So again, space forms us and architecture, it invites us into worship and it always wins. And then, because we know this happened. <laughs> and then your clergy and your deacons, your church leaders were like this. <laughs> And then um, church leaders, when we think about how to do liturgy without um, our altars are like this. <laughs> and as we consider the future, we may feel like Woody or we may feel like Buzz Lightyear. I'm not sure. <laughs> It'd be a fun uh, icebreaker question. <laughs> um, you know, Buzz Lightyear into infinity unknown or Woody saying, oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> And I think this was the picture of the pandemic. I was on the liturgy task force for the um, office of the bishop. And I feel like this is what this meme is what a lot of our conversations kind of look like, depending on where you were um, on the liturgical spectrum. But we know that we adapted, right? Um, we figured out how to do church together. Um, so our church space looked different during pandemic tide and it still does. We brought the altar outside. We went on Zoom. We um, brought our lectern, our pulpit outside, right? So we figured out um, how to continue um, to live into um, the spirit of, of the right, which we'll go into in just a second. So I guess a pausing question would be is like, how has the pandemic informed your understanding of the sacred space, your altar or your table at your church? How has the pandemic made you appreciate your church's altar? more or chancel area. So we'll just take a little moment, like a minute, and just think about those questions to ourselves. All right, we're gonna move now into the significance and history of um, the right space and objects associated with the altar. Okay, so as we you know, envision your own sacred space, we're using St. Gregory's as a point of reference here for our conversation. Um, when we gather for liturgy, we gather for Holy Communion, we gather to celebrate the Eucharist, which is what the 1979 prayer book really um, puts the celebration of the Eucharist as the heart of the liturgy. 
there are some movements in which we take to approach the altar. We gather, we enter through the doors, through the narthex, into the nave, um, and, and we gather as the, the communion of the body of Christ, and then we, we hear God's word proclaimed, and we prepare to receive um, this gift of God's grace, and then we go out to be God's gift of grace to the world being transformed. So let's talk a little bit about, um, since we're talking about both word and table, right? We had the image of the vested chalice and the gospel book. Let's just talk really briefly about the rite, what we're doing when we gather um, and all the action that takes place around or on the altar. The liturgy of the word, we gather as the body of Christ to proclaim God's story, to remember God's story, to find ourselves in God's story, and then to proclaim this good news. And we do this through um, the, re the readings and um, the first reading could be the Old Testament and epistle or just the Old Testament. We do a response of the psalm and then we have this procession of, of the gospel of the word coming into the church, right, and amongst the body of Christ. We um, confess our sins. We say that we're in need of God's help to change our ways. We pray for the needs of others. We exchange the peace. And when we gather every Sunday, it's a little Easter, right? We, we recall the story of God, a God who loved the world so much that God sent us Jesus, a God who created Israel as God's chosen beloved. And when they turned away time and time again, God sent the prophets and sages of old to call them back to turn to God again and again. And then finally, because um, you know, humanity in general, we're just so stubborn, <laughs> sent God's son so that we could be with God in eternity and, and um, God could be with us in eternity, in time and eternity. And so every time we gather um, as a group, as a church, a faith community, we listen to God's story and we find ourselves in God's story through our liturgical calendar. Um, we situate our, our readings, um, our focus into one of the moments in the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. And the liturgy of the word, it prepares us, it prepares our souls, it prepares our mindsets, it renews us um, for the liturgy of um, the great thanksgiving, uh, what happens at the altar table. Um, the liturgy of the great thanksgiving, we prepare the table. We make the Eucharist, we break the bread, we share the gifts, and then we're sent out to be the Eucharist. Um, St. Augustine so famously said, um, behold who you are, become what you receive. And we'll spend some time on that in just a little bit. So when we think about spaces in the history of like, where did we celebrate the Eucharist? It wasn't always in the church. It's not, it didn't always look as we received it today. As you remember, the Episcopal, the Episcopal Church, hmm. The Episcopal Church is part of the Jesus movement. Christianity began as a movement and then later became an establishment and then, of course, an institution. And we have our different denominations today. But in the beginning, whenever Paul was going around, right, on his three missionary tours and evangelizing, making Pauline and then Deuteropauline communities, these first Christian communities, the agape meal, the, the, the love meal of Jesus, remembering Jesus, the Eucharist was celebrated in people's homes, probably on their kitchen table, very domestic. People would come and, and um, the priest or the bishop would celebrate the Eucharist. And then, of course, we know that the church became more of an establishment under Constantine. And let's not forget his wife, Helena, who really is the one who took up this passion project of creating churches, cathedrals, basilicas at sacred spaces. And so as um, Christianity was um, um, more established as a religion, as part of the establishment, right? Um, and there's, I understand all sorts of problems around that, that you could get into in a whole nother class. Um, thank you, Stanley Hauerwas at Duke. Um, but all to say that this impacted the liturgy because all of a sudden we went from small spaces to large spaces. And you think about just how we've had to maneuver <laughs> um, during the pandemic with um, Zoom worship, live stream worship, small spaces, large spaces. I mean, we, we feel that too, but as a result, of the church becoming part of the establishment of all of these church buildings, bricks and mortars, huge cathedrals, basilicas built on, on these um, martyrs, graves, graveyards, all these sorts of things. 
then the liturgy had to change. So it became more formalized. We started chanting because you couldn't hear. We started having more ritual action of raising the bread. We started using smells and bells. Um, of course, the, the, the smells were really because it smelt so bad. And then we ascribed meaning to it, right? And we ascribed that beautiful song, Lord, let the prayers of um, you know the gathered be like the rising up of incense to you, right? Uh, we, we used a, a pall over that little um, square board over the chalice because flies would get in there and so we didn't want so we had to just change how we did liturgy we started processions um, so that this ritual act could say something about the word coming out into um, and the gospel coming out into the gathered and then as we um, became an institution um, and we're not going to get into that because we just don't have the time um, we receive um, the altar um, the chancel as we know it today. Um, as Mother Melissa mentioned last week, we are a people of the book. We are people of the Bible and of the Book of Common Prayer. Um, how did we know to celebrate Eucharist? Where do we get these text from whenever we're having these Eucharistic rites. How did the priest know what to say? Well, there are a few sources for us and, and we just named one of them as an object, which was the altar book. Um, we get this um, from, the, from scriptures, holy scriptures, right? Whenever um, Jesus is at the last supper and he offers um, the Passover meal, and he's talking about himself being the Paschal lamb, right? He's putting himself as the Paschal lamb who will take away the sins of the world. Um, and he's celebrating um, the, he's remember, he's doing the, the Last Supper. And then of course, we have these communities, like I mentioned, Paul, he created these Christian communities on all these missionary tours that then um, practiced um, remembering the Last Supper, remembering Jesus' sacrifice, remembering um, what God um, the Father did for um, Israel, for um, Gentiles through sending Jesus, the, the birth of the church through the Spirit, right? So our Eucharistic rites come from scripture, then they also come from um, sources like the Didache um, that documented what early Pauline, so what did those house church liturgies look like and sound like? So we have some, some sources from the Didache that say that. We have other ones. Then the Episcopal Church, we're going to fast forward like a lot of years. <laughs> we have the, the Book of Common Prayer, right? First in Latin and then translated by Thomas Cramner, uh, the 1552. And then, of course, um, for the Episcopal Church um, in um, tech, as we know it, we have um, the Book of Common Prayer in 1979. And before that, it was the 29 here. So we are people who are, we don't just make up the words, right? And so there are huge conversations that say, hey, we want to make more expansive language. We want to um, communicate um, in a way, speak in tongues, speak the gospel in a new vernacular that is going to speak to the people. Well, if you want to do that, um, you have to follow a form. And priests, we take a vow that we will obey the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the Episcopal Church. So we can't just go do this. We have to submit it to the bishop. But even better, we could look at these authorized liturgies, such as enriching our worship, that are already doing this work. Whenever we think about um, the biblical references to altars, we talked a little bit about the New Testament, but it's always important just to, to note, we're not going to stay here, that um, our understanding of altar comes from the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And so there are many references to um, the patriarchs, particularly, I don't know about any matriarchs, I would love for someone to put that in the chat box, but lots of the patriarchs creating altars um, in which they would burn some sort of sacrifice. I think the first one that was um, done was by, um, I thought it was by Noah, but um, maybe I'm wrong on that. Um, and then of course we have references to the tabernacle, which I noticed is, I, I noted is behind the altar. And the tabernacle we remember from the Old Testament being the place where the Holy of Holies was, remember? And in the beginning they had to, the Israelites had to bring the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle with them as God led them in the wilderness with pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. Um, so these are all rooted in um, our Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. 
So let's just take a pause there and go back to the altar as an object, as a sacred object that we have. So this um, definition here um, in the Latin would be an altar is a high or elevated raised structure where offerings or sacrifices would be made. And so my question is what happens on the altar? We're not gonna get too much into belief because I promise we would stay on practice and sacred space, but what you think happens at the altar, I'm gonna call it an altar, is go, what you think happens at that object right there is gonna inform what word you use to describe it, right? So if you think a sacrifice happens there, you're going to call it an altar. If you are more along the lines of um, real presence to remembrance, um, it's going to be a holy table or a table. Uh, you might be somewhere in between via media. You might call it an altar table because in the end, it's a mystery. <laughs> All to say, it matters um, to many people what you call it. I call it an altar that says something about my Eucharistic theology, but um, others might call it a holy table, a table. And in fact, um, whenever the Church of England, um, you know, had all these different great religious uh, or uh, theological um, strands emerging um, before the Eliz Elizabethan um, settlement, I believe it was, um, one thing that Queen Elizabeth did was, or the act of uniformity was to open up the rubrics to include altar, holy table, or table to try to make this tent wide. So we're still, we still live into that today. So what you call it, I call it an altar, then might, um, might uh, inform which of these objects you have around the altar, right? So if you think, um, and we'll and I'll, we'll get to the catechism just so we're all clear about our language. Um, but those who have a higher Eucharistic theology are going to be really happy about having a monstrance around. They might even want to include benediction during um, Compline, which we did at the cathedral when I had a lot of Anglo-Catholic um, clergy colleagues there. Um, you might want to include sanctus spells if you know. Uh, you might want to inc include incense. Um, depending on what you think is happening at the altar. Now, of course, uh, we have a generous orthodoxy. We're a wide tent. So it's perfectly reasonable for someone to call uh, what's happening um, during the Eucharist a table and have sanctus bells or have um, a different type of bell that's more modern or global. Um, these are all fine, of course, too. So we mentioned a little bit, whenever um, the... Um, church became part of the establishment, the established religion under Constantine, uh, the liturgy really changed a lot. And um, the Episcopal Church, as we receive our tradition, um, we continue to have um, some objects that date back to that time. And so I mentioned, and I just want to show it, that for example, you see this, um, the it would be like a square, um, a linen square, um, and it's um, right here. Do you all see it? It's called the linen pall. And um, like I mentioned, that was used originally to keep the flies away from getting into the line. I'm just curious, clergy who are here or Eucharistic ministers, who's got who's had a fly in your chalice? I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I literally was arguing with my rector one time because I wanted to use the pole and he didn't want me to. And I was like, but father, a fly might fly in. And it did. I was so justified. <laughs> Lord, forgive me for my pride. Um, then, of course, we have incense, which we talked about already. Um, with larger spaces, um, you know, um, the elevating the host was more important. Having a bell correspond to that during the three elevations. Um, so that people all the way in the back who maybe couldn't see through the root screen or couldn't see because they were so far back knew what um, was going on um, at the altar at a given time. I want to point out the lavabo bowl right here. I think the lavabo bowl might be one of my favorite sacred objects that are um, in the chancel surrounding the altar. So Whenever a priest goes, or if you have a deacon, the deacon sets your table um, right before you offer, um, you know, maybe some pre-mass prayers. I, I do this. Um, the priest or celebrant will wash their hands and they'll quote a line of scripture, a psalm, 
that um, basically ask God to forgive our um, Lord, wash me from all my iniquity and cleanse me from all my sins. And it's a way for the priest, um, this is a, a, an act that dates back um, to the Hebrew Bible, um, but it's a way for priests to, to recognize to themselves in front of God and the congregation that they are in need of God's grace just as anyone else is, and that they've been set apart to perform this function on behalf and with the community. Um, I think that's about it that I will say there. Um, so what is the Holy Eucharist? So since we're talking about this sacrament, uh, we are told if you go into the sacrament section that um, the Episcopal Church has two great sacraments as a language. I understand many people want to say we have seven sacraments. Um, some might argue that five of those are sacramental, but baptism and um, Eucharist are sacraments. I'm not going great sacraments. I'm not going to get into that. But I wondered if somebody here would mind reading um, the question and then another person the answer, just for all of them. This comes from the Book of Common Prayer and the Catechism. I can't see everyone. So um, let's see. Becky Jens, can I pick on you? Can you read and um, who else? Bernice, are you on here, Bernice? She's one of my readers. Let's see. Bernice, could you could you do the response? And Becky, could you do the question? Would that be okay? Yes. Okay, thanks. What is the Holy Eucharist? The Holy Eucharist is a sacrament commanded by Christ for the continual remembrance of his life, death, and resurrection until his coming again. Why is the Eucharist called a sacrifice? Because the Eucharist, the church's sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving is the way by which the sacrifice of Christ is made present and in which he unites us to his one offering of himself. By what other names is this service known? The Holy Eucharist is called the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion. It is also known as the Divine Lit Liturgy, the Mass, and the Great Offering. What is the outward and visible sign in the Eucharist? The outward and visible sign in the Eucharist is bread and wine, given and received according to Christ's command. What is the inward and spiritual grace given in the Eucharist? The inward and spiritual grace in the Holy Communion is the body and blood of Christ given to his people, and I can't see it, uh, received um, by faith. Yeah. What are the benefits which we receive in the Lord's Supper? The benefits we receive are the forgiveness of our sins, the strengthening of our union with Christ and one another, and the foretaste of the heavenly banquet, which is our nourishment and eternal life. What is required of us when we come to the Eucharist? It is required that we should examine our lives, repent of our sins, and be in love and charity with our people. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, we're going to transition into our final section. And I just have to ask, um, we end at 830. Is that, is that right? We've been ending a little bit before. It depends on the discussions and the breakout groups. Great, thank you. I just am keeping an eye. Thank you. Let's move into a time of reflecting together on the um, ways in which the space, these objects, these rites form us as disciples of Christ. So when we gather um, in uh, person or virtually, <laughs> we gather as Christ's body, we gather as a, a holy communion, we gather as um, those who are, are open, receptive, have been forgiven, have been loved, have been seen to receive this gift of grace. And we do that through lifting up our hearts to God, uniting them with God. Um, we do that through um, entering into a, a different time, a Kairos time, which is a time that is 
not like our, our um, chronos time, which is sequential, it's temporal, it's, um, it's a sort of thin heavenly time. And we do that with the rest of the faithful, those saints who have gone before us, our grandmothers who have gone to be with Jesus, our, our spouses who have gone to be with the Lord, our, our friends, um, those saints, um, matriarchs and patriarchs that we look up to, we, we gather throughout time and space in this sort of mystical moment of the Sanctus. And as we gather at the altar, we, we reenact um, and we enter into the time when all of creation will be gathered around the throne and worshiping God together. And one of the most beautiful ways that we enact this together, as we look forward as a for that the, the Eucharist is going to be a foretaste to this heavenly banquet, is through raising our voices um, with the Sanctus and singing or saying the Sanctus. And at this time, Mother Mary Kate, could you play the first clip? And I invite you just to listen to this and just imagine yourself like on a Sunday morning gathering with those who are here and those who have gone to be with the Lord and those who are yet to be. This is a piece from um, the Sanctus from um, Chorus Requiem Mass, and I thought it, people might appreciate it because um, All Souls is around the corner. Um, could we listen to just maybe the first two minutes of the second, and then we'll call it good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
your experience was when you were listening to that one of those pieces did you find yourself going to another place embodied where you were perhaps alone or perhaps sitting with somebody from your household I wonder what was that ex embodied experience for you um, one of the beautiful things about us gathering around the altar singing the song to so now that we can finally sing again um, congregational singing is that um, participatory embodied experience right of being grounded here and then being taken um, to the heavens right um, where we recall and are reminded that we join the heavenly hosts right um, in this um, Kairos time where heaven is brought to earth and earth is brought to heaven we're reminded that um, through Jesus's life, death, and resurrection ascension, that God has brought the kingdom here, and that we have these moments where we get to experience um, this sense of unity that um, surpasses time and space. Um, those brothers and sisters, siblings who are across the globe, those who have died, those are who are yet to be, and we're reminded of the promises of our faith right, um, that um, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, that we will be with God and God will be with us in time and eternity. And so we join the dance um, with, I should say, the mystical body of Christ. Um, these images are from um, St. Gregory of Nyssa in San Francisco um, that, you know, they're known for these um, dancing saints that are all around the church and, and sort of in the round surrounding the Eucharist. And, and, and this is the sort of action that happens. And so as we take time to reflect on the ways in which we gather around the altar, to experience Christ's real present in the bread and wine as we um, bring our, ourselves, as God sees us, as we offer our gifts, um, as we recall God's faithfulness and the stories of salvation that are told every time we celebrate the Eucharist about how God, um, you know, made creation out of love, called it good. And when we turned away, kept coming after us through prophets and finally through Jesus to reconcile all of creation to be with one another in God. As we gather as the body, the reconciled body, we, we um, behold who we are, right? We behold the Eucharist, the body of Christ. And um, as we prepare to receive it, we pray that we might become this body of Christ, this body that has been transformed through our gathering, through our um, receiving the transformed bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus, and we take time to reflect on the ways in which um, Christ is calling us to enact uh, the Eucharistic um, movements in our own life, where we recognize that we as Christians, as individual, as a church community, as the Episcopal Church in Colorado have been taken, blessed, broken, and given to the world who's desperately in need of God's grace, of being reminded that there is a God who loves them, hasn't given up on them, will never turn God's back on them and is rooting for them. There is a God who wants to see justice on earth as it is in heaven, wants to see mercy abound, wants to see um, people live into this abundance which Jesus has given us. And so this fourfold action that has been meditated upon by many theologians, including as you all may know, Gregory Dix, um, of being taken. So I wonder how in your life, um, how can you recall the ways in which God has taken you, has called you by name and baptism, has restored you to your best self, to your relationship with God and one another? How has, how has God blessed you? Blessed, how have you received your blessedness? Where are the places you've experienced brokenness in your life? Where are the places where God's redemption and grace and reconciling power have held you back together? Where are the places that you have given your life, um, given 
from this abundance, this riches of grace that God has poured into you, that you might be um, an occasion of grace for somebody else to dine on. As we leave um, the church space and the dismissal, we are invited to make the world a Eucharist. We're invited to make a world the Eucharist where we see our lives um, and falling into this rhythm, intentionally committing to this rhythm of being taken, blessed, broken, and given. And so as we end our time together, I want to invite us as we break out into small groups to reflect on these questions together. How do you proclaim the word or the gospel in your life? How have you found yourself in this God story? And how have you, with your church, continued to live out this story? What does the Eucharist mean to you? Um, we've all had a lot of time <laughs> during the pandemic when we committed to a Eucharistic fast to really take stock of what the Eucharist means to us. And as we've been able to regather and receive the Eucharist again, I'm sure you have really deep insights to share about what the Eucharist means to you. How is your church community, wherever you're coming from, and if you're not coming from a church community, you can take this as how are you? becoming what you receive? How are you becoming um, this thing we behold, the sacrament, this great sacrament, the, the, the symbol and um, visible symbol and sign of God's grace um, in the body and blood of Jesus? And how do you live the Eucharist? I wonder also, uh, what's your first memory of the Eucharist? Um, were you, um, um, when were you able to receive it? Uh, maybe you're not a cradle Episcopalian like myself. Um, um, and, and how has your understanding of the Eucharist grown or changed throughout your life? So at this time, um, I'm going to invite Mother Mary Kate to um, break us out. I just want to make sure we answered all the questions. Okay, cool. Thank you. I think you did. So I'll put people into breakout rooms, uh, but now I'm going to stop the recording and um, I'll pipe the questions into the rooms in just a moment. Liz, you might have to send the questions to me in the chat when you get a second. Sure. Uh, so thank you all for coming. And